Coming to you from the Spit Studios in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada, this is the Spit Sports Show. What an exhilarating weekend of NFL football, of NHL hockey, of NBA basketball even with the Thunder starting a uh, starting five of no one over six foot six and the Lakers going into Sham. There's a lot of sports to get to, but I want to start with the Sunday night matchup with my favorite team involved because I feel like when you have a team that you really care about and have insight on, I can give you guys the best possible analysis on what went down in the game that <clears throat> obviously the entire country was watching on Sunday night. So this is the Detroit Lions versus the Houston Texans. And to say the Texans came out of the gate swinging would be a massive understatement the Lions offense which the media has been non-stop praising for the past six weeks as an unstoppable force Bill Belichick went on the Pat McAfee show and basically said there's no way to stop them you can only hope to contain them he didn't say it in those exact words but that was his premise and the offense got flatly punched in the mouth in the first half. And the reason for that was when the Lions can't win the line of scrimmage, it throws off their offense so much because they're so used to having that under their complete and utter control because their offensive line has been so dominant for almost three years now. They're very used to having run blocks set up perfectly and working play action off of that. And obviously, it's way easier to pass protect when the defense can't pin their ears back and bull rush the passer. But that was kind of to be expected. The Texans were kind of expected to come out with more energy than the Lions were. They were pretty much a desperate team with the one seed and AFC standings kind of slipping from them, and they were coming off a horrendous performance against the New York Jets in prime time. They were coming off a mini bye week. Like I said, they got embarrassed by a bad team. And the Lions, on the other hand, were coming off their Lambeau Field game at Green Bay, where they were able to play a almost flawless game in Definitely not flawless conditions. They had a phenomenal game in conditions where a lot of people thought they couldn't. And the Texans' pass rush was just dominating the Lions' offensive line. Add on to that, they smartly bracketed and double-teamed Amon Ross St. Brown throughout the entire first half. And you get a very, very dominant first half by the AFC side of this matchup. Thankfully, though, the Lions defense balled out. They had two or three third and longs that they would love to have back. They had a third and 18 that the Texans converted, I think a third and 12. But other than that, they were able to hold the Texans to a couple field goals, make sure there were no back-breaking plays. And even with two turnovers that half, well, three if you include the Hail Mary, they were able to keep the Texans to a light roar instead of completely blowing the game open in the first half when it looked like it was trending in that direction. Speaking of the turnovers, Jared Goff. Um, listen, he was under pressure all game long. Um, I know there were no sacks against him this game, but it was his second highest rate of pressure in any game this year besides the game against Minnesota in Minnesota where Flores' whole plan was just blitz, blitz, blitz. But when I really looked back at every single golf interception and didn't just go off of the five interception stat that obviously is the headline for everybody this morning, let's go through them individually because the first one, it's a hot screen to the running back and the pass gets batted at the line and the Texans make a great play on it. Like you can't blame Goff for that. He's got to get the ball out of his hands pretty much as soon as the ball touches his hands and it got batted and picked. Okay, fine. Second interception. This to me was his worst play of the entire game. So Panay Sewell, who never gets beaten in pass protection clean, got beaten in pass protection clean for the first time I've ever seen it in my life. And there's a free rusher. 
So Goff is able to step up against the first swat attempt at the ball, but instead of dirting the ball or making a quick throw underneath to where he doesn't have to fully extend backwards, for some reason he thinks that the edge rusher who just came free wasn't going to make another play on the ball or maybe he was just going to give up. I don't know what was going through Goff's mind, but he decided to wind the ball up again. Of course, it gets knocked out, except instead of fumbling like it normally would, it goes up in the air, bounces around everywhere, intercepted. So probably that's more of a fumble-worthy play than an, inter- than an interception-worthy play. But it's an interception at the end of the day. I didn't think that play was all that great by Goff. But again, it happens. Third, the Hail Mary. It was a weak Hail Mary attempt. But Hail Marys get picked off. What are you going to do? The fourth one, I don't know exactly who to blame because I'm not in the locker room. I don't know their route tree. I don't know how they want to run these different concepts. But it sure looked to me like Goff thought Jamison Williams was going to go on a 65 upfield instead of a 45 to the corner, if that makes sense. That's how he threw it anyways. Jamison clearly thought that it was more of a 45 corner route than a 65 fade route, and they paid for it by not being on the same page, and that was a bad, bad bad-looking interception. But again... I don't feel like that was due to Goff not seeing the field properly or even throwing an inaccurate pass. I think that was just due to some miscommunication, which can be cleaned up. I don't know if that was on quarterback or receiver. But on the fifth one, or the fourth one, sorry, the fifth overall, Laporta, I feel like you just got to get your head around. Now, did Goff throw that ball too early? Yeah, probably. But as I mentioned, he was under pressure all game. So the last thing you want to do in that situation is take a sack, kick you out of field goal range. He put that ball right where it was supposed to be and right on the money for an in-breaking route. It's just, again, Laporta just couldn't quite turn his head fast enough to make a break on the ball. Defender read it perfectly and caught it. Great play. So out of those five interceptions, really, there's one where it's like, okay, what are you doing there? But it's not like they were the interceptions that he was throwing early in the year. The one against Arizona where he threw it right to the linebacker. or Any of those where it's like, what are you doing? It was more just wrong place, wrong time, in my opinion. But the defense, which played really good in the first half, had to play all-time great in the second half for the Lions to even have a chance at taking this game home with five turnovers. And that is exactly what they did. We knew coming into this game that the Texans interior offensive line was by far the weakest point of their offense. And the Lions had to take advantage of that with their two interior pass rushers. Both are just studs. Ali McNeil in particular as a pass rushing stud. And he had a game and a half. He was unbelievable in pass rush, in run stuffing. He was just great. I thought he was really, really awesome in critical third downs. I thought DJ Reader did his thing this game. I thought it was his best game as a Lion, especially against the run. Everybody thought and everybody knew that coming into this game, the Texans' big strategy was going to be to run the ball, to keep possession of the ball, keep it out of Detroit's hands, and straight up, Detroit's run defense hasn't been the same as it was last season. But this game it was. It was even better than last season. It was fantastic all around. Unbelievable performance by those two interior defensive linemen. And Jack Campbell, as an off-ball linebacker, getting drafted mid-first round a couple years ago, everyone was very critical of that pick because off-ball linebackers, with the way offenses are playing with in the play-action game nowadays and constant motion... They're not quite as valuable as they were back in the day. However, if you can get an off-ball linebacker who can stuff the run as well as play in coverage, then that's an incredibly valuable chess piece to any football team. And Jack Campbell's pass coverage from last year to this year has been a complete transformation of this defense. The way he can go on to tight ends, he had another great pass breakup today. I thought he was phenomenal against the run. He's clearly unafraid of getting in the box and tackling. 
Him and Alex Anzalone, that is a heck of an off-ball linebacker duo. Add on top of that, the best safety duo in the league. And again, that's not my opinion. You saw the pro football focus grades on Sunday night. You had number one for Kirby Joseph, number two for Brian Branch. And Kirby Joseph is obviously unbelievable. What a free safety this guy is. But I just want to talk about Brian Branch for a second because... There aren't many defensive players, especially non-pass rushers, <coughs> non-pass, non-pass rushers, who you can watch their highlights and just be taken away to another world, it feels like. Like the way that this guy is able to break on routes, the way he's able to read spots from the safety position and play slot corner and play outside if you ask him to, and switch from zone to man to man mid-play. Wow. What an unbelievable football player this guy is. And he's only in year two. And he's only going to get better is the scary part. This guy is going to be the best safety in the league for a long time. And add on to that, the best free safety in the league in Joseph playing center field. And it's going to be tough to throw on the lines deep for a while, it seems like. Add on to that. Carlton Davis was a phenomenal offseason pickup. He had a rough first couple of weeks, but lately he has been just settling in and he was due for a couple of interceptions. And most things in sports tend to come in bunches. And did they ever for him? Obviously, that was a huge turnover coming out of half. And the second one I thought was even bigger because Stroud had a touchdown. If he just threw that either earlier or with a bit more velocity on it, instead of putting so much air underneath the ball, that's a touchdown. But Carlton Davis refused to give up on that play, sprinted to the corner, and was rewarded for his efforts with that huge interception. The Lions needed turnovers to get back in that game, and they got them both by the same guy. And even with the Lions offense being completely out of sync and out of order for the majority of the game, when it mattered most, when it was winning time, they figured out ways to win. I want to shout out Jamison Williams real quick because I thought he had a fantastic game throughout, which was not easy to say for a lot of the offense. But first half, second half, all of it, he made huge third down catches. That one in particular where golf threw it high, Jamison Williams took a shot to his back. Like majority of the time, that's a drop. But strong hands held on to it for a third down conversion. That was big. That bobble on third and 15 where he was able to maintain focus and catch that. Goff threw another laser beam to him on another third down. Tough catch made it. He was really good yesterday. Obviously, St. Brown with the biggest third down conversion of the day on that third and six to get us in field goal range. Unbelievable. Both running backs got it done when they needed to. And Jake Bates. Like... Wow, what a story this guy is. Um, quick anecdote, I like to listen to every single piece of Lions media I can. I listen to the players speak. I listen to the coaches speak just because obviously I like to be in tune with what's going on with my favorite team. And I was thinking after his game winner against the Vikings, you know, I've never heard this guy speak at the podium. I wonder what his, what his vibe is going to be all about, blah, blah, blah. And within the first 30 seconds, he says, I just want to give all credit to my long snapper, my holder and Jesus. And it's just like, OK, like this might be just the team of destiny. You know what I mean? Like everybody is built like that. Everybody is team first and selfless. And it's just unbelievable. So obviously the good of this is the Lions threw five interceptions against a division leading Super Bowl contending preseason opponent and won the game. That's ridiculous. And to be eight and one through nine weeks or through 10 weeks, I guess, because we had the bye, what a spot to be in for this squad. The bad, though, and it's really only one thing, but I can't be the guy up here who's all sunshine and rainbows all the time for the Lions, even at eight and one. Because I have a funny feeling that Terry on Arnold might cost us a playoff game. Now, he's young, and he's only going to get better. That's what Lions Twitter keeps telling me. But this season, that's all I'm talking about. This season, doesn't it feel like 
against a really good team that can throw the ball downfield, he's going to give up a 55-yard pass interference penalty. He's just not disciplined enough. He doesn't look at the ball while it's in the air to make a play on it. He's got awful timing for his breaks on receivers. I think he stands too low in his press stance. Don't take my word for that. Like, obviously, I haven't played a day of corner in my life. That's what Sauce Gardner says, and I feel like he knows a thing or two. He's obviously got all of the athleticism. I think he's got all of the character traits from what I've seen from him, his interviews and the way he interacts with his teammates. But if he doesn't get his fundamentals down as an NFL cornerback and the way these refs are calling these games with these holding calls and pass interference, simply put, he's going to cost us a playoff game and it's going to be devastating. So Terry on Arnold, I am straight up calling you out. Be better on your fundamentals quit with these penalties you could have cost us the game on sunday night like you were early on that third down conversion that definitely should have been pass interference texans get the first down there and they're probably kicking a walk-off field goal instead of us so be better but obviously overall super happy about where the lions are at they have nowhere to go but up from here so With that being said, I want to talk about a team that does have some places but up to go, and that is the Vancouver Canucks because that was a really bad, really bad loss against the Whalers on Saturday night. Now, most fans blame fatigue for their third period collapse where the Oilers scored four pretty quick ones and the Canucks were just completely out of it from there on, but objectively you can't say that they were plenty rested they haven't had a back-to-back all season they've been in the same time zone for a couple of weeks here it's not an energy or fatigue issue for me to me it's just bad defensive awareness on so many of the goals it seemed like the Canucks were just so focused on playing their specific position on the ice and, you know, their defensive system that they forgot that the Oilers can do things other than pass the puck around the outside. And they've got inside so much and got so many quality chances. But I want to start with the good of what's going on for the Canucks right now and in the future, because obviously fans and the organization alike are super excited about Lekker coming up to the NHL. Now, This guy has been the talk of Abbotsford for a good couple years now. Unbelievable shot, very good puck skills, fast skater. I worry a little bit about his ability to win puck battles consistently, especially with how poor the Canucks have been winning those lately. But when you're giving him top six time with JT Miller and P.U. Suter, which they have been doing these past couple practices, I also do really like that Lekromecki has gotten a pretty significant amount of practice time before he steps into the lineup here, which is pretty rare for guys coming up from the minors. And I think Lekromecki could do some really good things. Obviously, when you're playing with Miller and you can shoot, it's a pretty good thing. So we'll see how that plays out. But that's the worst it's going to do is add a much needed offensive spark to this team because. Simply put, they've struggled with offensive production from a few of their players, but I'm going to get into that when I get into the bad. Um, Another really good thing was that was an awesome win against the Kings on Thursday night. Um, Obviously, when you play against the Kings neutral zone trap, you want to not carry the puck in as much as you can. You want to get behind that trap and attack from there, which I didn't think the Canucks were going to be able to do. Last season, they were really bad against the Kings. I think they were 1-3-1 and one or 1-4 one and four against the Kings last year. Really good win. And they were constantly on the attack. That game wasn't really in doubt from the ha- about halfway through the second period on. So good on them for that. Quinn Hughes and Kale McCarr. And this is going to kind of tie into the Canucks' bad at the end of this. But those two really look like they're go- they are the second coming of Ray Bork and Paul Coffey. Now, some of you younger viewers out there, I get that I'm saying that as a young content creator, but some of you younger viewers out there might not know about Ray Bork and Paul Coffey, but those two were putting up 
first line center numbers as defensemen. And they are the two highest scoring defensemen of all time. And they just happen to be playing in the same era, revolutionizing the game in their own ways. And like McCarr, ridiculous so far this year. His counting numbers, 24 points in 16 games on an avalanche team that always seems to be just devastated by injuries. He's keeping them afloat, obviously, along with Nathan McKinnon, who is no slouch, probably the MVP of the league again so far. But when it comes to advanced metrics and impact to his team, like Quinn Hughes's numbers are literally off the charts. So I found this graph. It's no longer valid anymore because a couple games have been played. But in terms of Corsi 4 and Fenwick 4, which their advanced metrics you can look up if you want to really get into the brass detail of what they mean. But in general, the higher your Fenwick and Corsi, the more offensive production you're providing. His Corsi 4 right now is at 63%. No other Canuck is above 54%. His Fenwick 4 is at 63%. No other Canuck is above 57%. Quinn Hughes's impact on the Canucks is stupid. It they turn into a completely different team when he's on the ice versus off the ice. The way he's able to move the puck just by himself, either through skating or taking a second look to make a play or taking a back step in the corner or skating back, he just looks totally in control of a this system, b this team, and c of everybody else on the ice. He has had. A Norris caliber season, no doubt about it. And it looks like it's going to be him and McCarr dueling for that trophy for the next 10 years. He is just unbelievable. Um, more good things for the Canucks. Obviously, Thatcher Demko, full participant in practice for the first time in months the other day. Um, he looks to be back sometime around the holidays. And it seems like talk it's going to be incredibly conservative with his return. They don't, he shot down immediately the idea that he might be a backup in the next coming weeks. He's they're going to give him complete health. And obviously adding a Vesna caliber goalie is going to be great. Even with Kevin Lankin and playing out of his mind, we all know he's going to come back down to earth. Eventually he just has to. So that's going to be a big boost and big boost for the forward core. I've mentioned before, Joshua coming back is huge energy guy, unbelievable puck battle winner. He'll play anywhere in the lineup from the fourth line to the first line. And you can feel very confident that he's going to do his job, which is all you can ask for a guy who you're not expecting to score 40, but you are expecting to provide those little big things that allow hockey teams to win games. So he'll be coming back within the next couple of weeks, easing into the lineup Huge energy booster for the Canucks. He's awesome. I love Dakota Joshua. But let's get into the bad. Because the bad thing about Quinn Hughes being so good and so dominant is it's exposing just how bad the rest of the Canucks D is at moving the puck. And I'm going to hammer this point home until someone changes something. Because besides Quinn Hughes, our puck movement on the defensive end is a flat-out joke. And I mentioned this last year in the playoffs against the Oilers, and it reared its ugly head again in the regular season against the Oilers. The Canucks can't move the puck once it's hemmed in their zone because their defense just aren't good skaters. They're not able to make a clean play to the wing so he can move it to the middle and get out of the zone. They're not able to make smart plays because they can't create enough space for them to think about smart plays. Overall, you can't have Myers, Susie, all of these guys who just can't skate and expect to not constantly be hemmed in your own zone. This is an issue. They need to acquire someone like, I don't know, a Chris Tanev or like he's definitely too expensive, but a worse version of someone like that just to make sure the second line of defense can break the puck out consistently because Myers is really bad at it. Really, really bad. And the rest of the defensemen are no better than he is. And out on top of that, listen, I'm sick and tired of calling this guy out, but I'm going to do it. I know he had two points against the Oilers. Um, one of them was meaningless. Pedersen has the same amount of points as Kiefer Sherwood and Teddy Bluger. 
and we're paying him 11 and a half mil. Can't happen. Uh, it just flatly can't happen. And if you take away those that point from last night, he has less points than both of those guys, and he doesn't have a whole lot more points than, you know, just guys who make tens of millions of dollars less than him. And I don't want to put extra pressure on a guy because of his contract, but listen, this is the NHL. That's what comes of it. If you want to be paid the big bucks, you better play with the big boys. And I say this again, he looks timid. He looks unconfident. Whenever he goes into the corners, he doesn't really go low on his stick. He always keeps it up high. It looks like he's almost trying to poke check at the puck instead of trying to forcefully take it away. I've not been impressed with what I've seen from Pedersen. And obviously, the Canucks' fourth line right now is barely a good AHL first line. Now, a lot of that has to do with injuries, and it'll get better. But for now, that's a problem. But Canucks have a big game against the Flames tonight. Divisional opponent, if they get that done, they'll be 8-3-3 three, and three, and in just fine position for the rest of their season. But... I will say acquiring a puck moving defenseman should be something the Canucks desperately look into before the trade deadline. It should be. As always, thank you guys so much from the bottom of my heart for watching. If you made it all the way through this, please comment Kiefer Sherwood. Comment Kiefer Sherwood if you made it this far, and I will be sure to like your comment, reply, send you a DM with something. I will be so excited if you guys made it this far because it really means the world to me please leave a like on the video if you enjoyed what you heard today please subscribe if you're enjoying what you're hearing on the channel the spit sports show just hit over 350 subscribers big things happening and as always i will see you all in the next episode peace out